This is Racing Across America with Seth Merrow. Welcome back to Racing Across America. Wednesday morning means a visit from Jeremy Plonk, horseplayernow.com, countdown to the crown. Again, I'd like to count, count that countdown to the crown column, which comes out uh, every Friday. Previews and reviews comprehensively of the three-year-old scene, and we'll touch on some of the races that were uh, previewed last Friday in the package, because I think there was some good three-year-old uh, action this past weekend. Good morning, Jeremy. Good morning. Great to be with you, Seth. You know, it's National Signing Day in college football. I was telling you in the break, so this is a very optimistic day of the year if you're a college football fan. And as horse racing fans, we certainly enjoy that optimism and the thrill of finding that next great prospect. And, and we've got a Triple Crown Fantasy League draft tonight, too, among some of the national media members uh, that I've been part of over the past decade or so. So I've got the number 11 pick, so I don't know what I'm going to be able to do with that this year. But uh, we'll see how it all pans out. Yeah, see if somebody filters down to number 11, how that works out. But uh, at the... Uh, Triple Crown nominations came out the other day, and, and there was a, an omission that uh, struck me, and there was a horse we talked about, I think just last week or a couple of weeks ago, Exodus was not on the list. Well, yeah, neither of Larry Jones' really good uh, three-year-olds. Bluff, also the a very impressive maiden winner. Uh, Fox Hill Farms, they didn't nominate either, and also Divining Rod, a horse who I have a lot of respect for that we're going to talk about a lot here in the, uh, during the course of this segment, not nominated as well. Now, you can nominate later on for 6000 but, you know, for 600 you figure they throw your name into the pot at this time of the year. So uh, a bit of a surprising move there. I don't know if it's taxable, if there's any real reason behind it. But, you know, you, you would expect the horses of that kind of quality from those kind of connections, Leo Stables and, and Fox Hill Farms, you'd expect those to only have 600 bucks if they had something decent. Yeah, it was a, that was a little bit of a head-scratcher, but uh, we'll see how it plays out going forward. All right, let's get into some of the uh, races um, and I sent you the races that, that we were going to look at, and then you uh, re sent an email back and said you had one more race that you would like to look at, and this is going back to last Friday at Santa Anita. We pulled up an optional claimer, non-winners are one other than uh, for uh, three-year-olds going a mile, and uh, we're going to watch the number one prospect park get it done. Seven to two, seven to two second choice in here. The one to two favorite, the Gomper, uh, for uh, Ron Ellis, winds up running fourth in the field of five in here, but it's a pretty nice win from Prospect Park, and I guess you were uh, quite impressed with this. Yeah, Prospect Park was a horse who I loved off of his maiden win. It beat Cyrus Alexander and some other horses where he took multiple challenges and was really gutty, and, and I had that horse up at number 12 last week, even before this race went off, and, and now he's up in my top five. I think Prospect Park is a horse we really want to keep our eyes on. He's got the pedigree. This race went in 24s all the way around the track, which you just love to see in a route race, and he exploded home, as you see him. He just, just he did it as easy as you could possibly do. I, I, a lesson in betting here is, is when handicapping the race and previewing the race, I assume Prospect Park would be about 6-5, to five and the Gomper would be about even money in a five-horse field. But the public went all in on the Gomper. Prospect Park paying $9 is ridiculous. He should have paid 4 or 5 bucks in this race, so... It's one of those where I'll be honest with you, I didn't stick around and watch the race live. I didn't think it would be worth betting. And this is one where I wish I had conditional <laughs> wagering in because, uh, you know, this horse at $9 in a five-horse field was an absolute steal. And, and we'll see where he goes from here. But it's obviously a stakes race next for him. Uh, Cliff Spice said he's going to try to take the, an easier path if he can find it because the West Coast is so tough. So don't uh, be shocked if Prospect Park hits the road somewhere along the line and looks for something on the road next um, because this is a really good-looking three-year-old. You know, I'm just looking, talking about betting, too. Uh, it wasn't quite bridge jumper level, but with the Gomper running fourth, still the show prices were okay. Prospect Park pays 980 to win, five to place, and five to show. Yeah, and, and you know, the, the Gomper was coming out of sprint races, and everybody bought the thought that uh, Ron Ellis was selling that, oh, this horse is a router. Wait till he routes, wait till he routes. And he was really the hype cheesy horse, as his buddy Bob Newmeyer likes to call him. This is the she-she horse of the West Coast, and everybody jumped in on the Gomper. I'm not sure why. I mean, he looked, like I said, even money six to five. The two looked like, even with the hype, 
that they're fairly evenly matched coming off of their most recent races. But the public, again, went 1-2 to two on the Gompers, 7-2 to two on Prospect Park, and, and really that was a dream. I mean, when you're wagering, that when you have a good horse in a short field and an overlay, probably what more can you ask for as a gambler? Yeah, as you say, a five-horse field, that almost $10 was fairly generous. All right, let's go back to another race from last week during the week, the rescheduled Whiteley at Laurel. Uh, this had originally been scheduled for the prior Saturday. The weather postponed it. They redrew it, and on the redraw, Chad Brown puts in Majestic Affair coming off a win in the Capicella up at Aqueduct on January 2nd. I guess the extra time was just enough to get squeeze this one in another four or five days. And uh, with uh, Majestic Affair coming in, Golden Years comes out. That looked like the only competition. And as we watch the stretch run, that's pretty much as it plays out as uh, Majestic Affair as the one to five favorite wins by almost six lengths. But I think uh, Chad Brown has, has a nice one here. He does, and, and necessity is the mother of invention, as they say. It's leave the light on, leave the Triple Crown Trail as a proven route horse for Brown, and looks like you know the Remsen winner is the his A-list horse, perhaps for the spring. You get horses like this who now step up. But just fair, really finished up nicely. There's nothing in the pedigree that tells me that that distance, you know, up, up to a mile and sixteenth or so won't be any problem. And and like all of them, they have to prove that they can go from a mile and sixteenth to that mile and eighth and a mile and a quarter. But I like this horse. This was a nice race and, and an impressive performance. There wasn't much in the field after the scratch, like you talked about, when Golden Years came out of it. But I think Brown's got himself a good one here, so a horse who's capable of uh, being thrown into the Gotham discussion and see where he shakes out, um, you know, in a race like that. Uh, but I like Majestic Affair. Right? This was a really good week for the three year olds. I'm going to say I like a lot of horses. And you know, in the past, in the past couple weeks, a lot of the commentary has been nice performance, but not a horse I look at for down the road. This past Saturday and, and, and over the weekend, I think there were a lot of good horses we can look forward to. Yeah, I agree. And one that is going to be interesting to watch in the third career start is, uh, is, is going to be Ocean Knight. And Ocean Knight, Sam Davis on Saturday, uh, coming off of that career debut effort, which was very impressive, the middle of December at Aqueduct. So goes off as the 8-5 to five favorite for McLaughlin and Stone Street. Barbara Banky, I saw her in the winner's circle afterwards, so she had enough confidence to show up at Tampa Bay Downs. We're going to watch the stretch run. It will be number 11, Ocean Knight, getting up by a neck over Divining Rod, the horse you mentioned earlier. And I'm going to be interested to hear your take on this because obviously only the neck win you may question, but I said this on Sunday as we reviewed this race here on uh, OTV TV. A, uh, first... Uh, Stakes race for this horse, first time around two turns. And you know what? I think the Vining Rod might turn out to be a very nice horse. So I think this neck win is probably better than it looks. Oh, I agree with you 100%. And I'll tell you what, when you showed the replay, I covered my eyes. I didn't want to watch it again because I had the Vining Rod at 28 to 1. Oh, and, no. and, and looked like a sure winner. You know, after he, he, he took two challenges, he put away the sprinter Catalina Red. Then he put away the impressive allowance winner, my Johnny Be Good. It looked like he was clear at the top of the stretch, and, and he didn't back up. These horses came home fast, and, and, and the winner was just better. And so, they, you know, it was one of those difficult beats. Probably as tough a beat as I've had in the countdown uh, uh, with a public selection in a major stakes race, maybe in the 10 years of the program. We've had some nice winners over the years and some bombs come in in that 20 to 25 to 1 range. But to lose a tough one like that at 28 to 1, and I'll be honest with you, Earlier today, on one of my best bets on our budget sheet, I hit the 18 to 1 winner in the Endeavor Stakes beforehand. And so I was playing with some house money and playing with a little extra confidence. So this was a really hard beat at 28 to 1 because there was a little extra sauce on this one that I normally would have played. And so at that kind of price, it was a rough go. But uh, we, we still got the place money. And, and I didn't like the winner going into the race from the 11 hole. So as a gambler, I didn't play the exact as I, I, I tossed the favorite in this race from that tough close position. Now, in hindsight and reviewing the race and being honest about it, you have to give the winner credit. You know, I mean, when you when you overcome that outside post like that, Ocean Knight and just a second career start, you get a lot of praise for that kind of victory. You might bet against him at a shorter price um, on Saturday, but coming out of the race, you have to just look at him and say, wow, this is a really nice performance. These were good horses. They just missed the stakes record. They were five lengths in front of the rest of the field at the wire. And the fractions, again, are just... 24, I mean, listen to these fractions, 24-29, 24-46, 24-22, 24-38, 24, and 6-39 the last 16. I mean, that is an absolute perfect mile and a 16th kind of race that you want to see from really talented horses. 
typically they're going to slow on the dirt as the fractions go along. These horses just threw down 24 the other uh, all the way. They came home fast. I think the top two horses here are both major stakes winners in the future. They're, they've got big races on their on their dock. And uh, I will remind people the countdown to the Crown Package comes out on Fridays. And that Divining Rod selection was right there. You just missed there. But if other folks like the favorite, maybe they took advantage of that $107 exacta. And I will also note in the couple of stakes we're just going to mention coming up, you had the winners of both of those on top. So uh, you can take advantage of Jeremy's thinking with the Countdown to the Crown Package on Fridays as well. And let me just touch on here, pulled up uh, the... Uh, Louisville Courier Journal Kentucky Derby media poll. Now this came out Saturday, so obviously some of the weekend results weren't known. You had Texas Red on top, uh, Divining Rod number uh, nine, and I'm seeing uh, Ocean Knight not in your top ten. How would things shake out after the weekend as far as Ocean Knight and Divining Rod? Well, in the interest of fairness, because it was a new graphics package and they needed things actually on Friday for Saturday, so we even submitted a little bit earlier. I didn't get to see the Prospect Park race by the time we put in that poll either for the first week um, because it was the first week of the season. Typically, we'll do those on Saturday nights after seeing all the major prep races. So, Divining Rod was in there beforehand. The horse was really liked a lot. Uh, so, Prospect Park, Divining Rod, both move up there. Ocean Knight's going to be right on the cusp of that top ten as well. Um, I'm kind of working on the top ten right now and massaging it. There are a couple other horses I like. Uh, um, there's some horses who are running back this you know, week that we're going to see for the first time. And, and, and so um, it's going to be uh, – Ocean Knight's going to be in that top 12 area, may crack into the top 10, but he's right in that mix because I think he and Defining Rod are very similar horses. I think they both overcame a lot in that particular race, and, and so they're not far separated. So if Defining Rod's number nine, then you know that uh, – Ocean Knight is right in that same neighborhood. All right, let's go to uh, Turfway uh, on Saturday. The 96 Rock, uh, $75,000, six and a half furlongs, and you might think, eh, $75,000 uh, sprint race at Turfway. Uh, what's the interest here? But you and I talked about this race last week, and it was intriguing because of the eventual winner. The Great War started the career for Aiden O'Brien in Europe. They came over and tried the Breeders' Cup Juvenile and ran fourth. Now, the winners? Uh, or the first three finishers, let's say, Texas Red, Carpe Diem, and Upstart. Upstart, of course, comes back uh, and makes the big win last weekend. And now the Great War continues to flatter the Breeders' Cup Juvenile. We'll, we'll watch the stretch run from the 96 Rock. And the Great War at 1-9 uh, to nine wins pretty easily in here for Wesley Ward. He does. I mean, and this is an impressive uh, race visually. The jockey... Uh just looking under his arm the whole stretch run. You know, Alvin Hemsen is looking around for competition and he doesn't find it. And, and, and the great war, you know, he was dueled early by Furious Soft Horse that Mike Maker had in there who was unbeat, hadn't really run against much, and stepping up out of the claiming rank. But the great war dispatched him easily and just, just posted home. This was a nice comeback race. This is where you want to see an easy spot. And, and, you know, this is a situation where this horse was supposed to win. It, how was he going to pour it on, and how impressive was he going to look visually? Is really what you can take out of the race. And the answer to both of those was excellent. You know, I mean, he, he did what you wanted to see. Obviously, it's going to get steeper and tougher as he goes longer uh, and steps up in class. But there's a lot of pedigree on the damn side of this horse, you know, that's got dirt in it. They're almost all Claiborne uh, farm horses on the damn side of the pedigree. But there are a lot of short runners, you know, seven furlongs, miler types on the bottom of that pedigree. So the great war, you know, will he get a mile and a quarter with Wesley Ward's training? Ward mostly a speed trainer for the most part. That's a big question mark for me, whether he's a mile and a quarter horse. But he's one of the exciting horses of this year's crop, you know. You got, you got the cool Ward transfer to Wesley Ward. Ward was, you know, had a career year last year, so now can he make that rise up after the Great Breeders' Cup? Will he rise up and become a triple crown horse as well? The, the dominant win, you've got some question marks. This is a kind of, you know, titillating horse that's exciting for the, for the trail, and you like to see in there this year. And he also, again, like you said, makes that Breeders' Cup juvenile look well, and, and it's a very strong juvenile historically, one of the better ones we've seen in, in the last several years, I think. Yeah, for me, this horse has a couple of questions. Uh, distance and surface. And, yeah, he was fourth in the mile and 16th uh, uh, Breeders' Cup Juvenile at Santa Anita on dirt there. But he was, you know, eight lengths back. And as you made the great point last week, Wesley Ward, with a promising three-year-old, has this horse based at Turfway Park. So you have to think they wanted that synthetic. 
you, you have to imagine the spiral is probably in the future. So it's not just the distance. For me, it's how will this horse do on dirt. Again, we can look back at the Breeders' Cup Juvenile, see the fourth place finish, but he was, well, you know, he's fourth, but he was fairly well beaten there. So for me, there are still some questions on this horse. Yeah, and you know what's really cool is you say, well, Wesley Ward, Turfway, January, what in the world, with, you know, with, with, uh, with the Breeders' Cup Juvenile fourth place finisher. Well, what's happened in one year already, Seth, is horsemen have realized the Kentucky Derby point system is completely meaningless. We've talked about it, you know, since that point system was instituted, that it's going to be much ado about nothing. Already, you are seeing brazen placement of horses this year that was not the case last year. These horses were all saved for the points races later in the spring. Nobody would do a throwaway race. The San Vicente was a Kobe back and a bunch of sprinters last year, not a Texas Red. Now you've got the fourth place finisher in the juvenile coming back, and a six furlong race at Turfway with absolutely no points and, and very little earnings or anything along those lines. People realize that if you have a good horse and you get to May, you're getting in the dirt. And, and so I, I, I think it's making the front end of this season so much more exciting than what we saw last year. Better horses in the Le Comp. This edition of the Sam Davis was infinitely better than what we saw last year with Vincent Ramos and, and, and a couple Woodbine horses involved. I mean, this, this, this January has just been so much better than what we saw last year. And I think it's because we got to the end of that, that, that panic attack in the, in the Derby points case last year, and everybody got to the first Saturday in May and said, well, geez, we still don't have 20 in the entry box, and, and, and it's it, it's not that big of a deal, the point. So people are conditioning their horses a little more old school. Let's bring them back in an easy race. Let's bring them back in a sprint and build towards May, and I think that's great. And speaking of bringing back in a sprint, let's take a look at that San Vicente. And again, going back to the uh, uh, Kentucky Derby uh, uh, Courier Journal poll, the media poll, uh, your top ten, you had Texas Red on top, and that was the consensus uh, number one in the uh, Courier Journal media poll in their inaugural poll this past weekend. Texas Red number one made the comeback on Sunday in the San Vicente and again kind of old school seven furlongs grade two event couple hundred thousand dollars we had Steve Haskin on Sunday morning with us and he noted how this was a little bit of an old school kind of thing and he thought it was a really intriguing spot to maybe put a little speed into Texas Red because he said you know speed in the Derby is is pretty important thing and so maybe start them out and get a little speed in them and if it's a second place finish that's okay and a good foundation to build on and then Haskin kind of went off on Lord Nelson and how positive he felt about that horse you also put Lord Nelson on top as I say in your countdown to the crown package we'll watch the stretch run it will be number one Lord Nelson getting it done just barely as the uh, nine to five second choice over 70 cents to the dollar Texas red in here but I think both of these horses uh, acquitted themselves well. And again, I thought for you know the three-year-old debut, the second-place finish for Texas Red was a good foundation to move forward from. Uh, yeah, absolutely. If you like Texas Red, you still like him just as much after this race. I mean, it's not all about winning every single race. And, and this was a means to an end. And so a great starting off point. They came home fast. You know, these horses rock at home. And, and if you like the brisk late pace figures, I think you get something like a 112, which is the fastest of any any horse in their last race in the three-year-old crop. If you look at all the Triple Crown nominees, that 112 late uh, brisk pace figure in this race for Texas Red is the best of anybody in those 400-plus horses in their last start. So great comeback race. It's exactly what you want to see. Both Lord Nelson and Texas Red galloped out very well, side-by-side, side, long past the wire. Uh, both look like they had plenty more. From a handicapping standpoint, you knew the price would be the, the similar to what they went off, and that Lord Nelson would probably pay about twice as much as Texas Red. And, and, and Texas Red, you know, it was a good matchup, but who needed the race more? Lord Nelson needed this race to acquit himself after that uh, troubled trip in the Kentucky Jockey Club at Churchill. I thought he couldn't lose that day at Churchill Downs, and he had a bad trip, a wide post, and, and, and was flat late. He needed a race like this to get himself back on the beam, and Baffert tightened the screws on him. He won this race, um, and, and now they'll both move on to bigger and better things. Texas Red's going to head to the Risen Star at Fairgrounds. I would also expect Lord Nelson to probably, you know, do the chuck and dive away from Dortmund and some of the other Baffert horses. So Baffert will divide and conquer. You know he's going to frequent Oaklawn Park with American Pharaoh. Uh, you know he also goes to Sunland for the Sunland Derby a lot. Uh, Baffert known to go to the Wood Memorial as well. And now Keeneland back on dirt. The last time they had a dirt bluegrass at Keeneland, it was Bob Baffert and Sinister Minister. So you know Baffert's going to have something for the bluegrass as well. He's going to go back to that track looking for some speed. 
and try to recapture a little history there. So you can see Lord Nelson, Dortman, American Sparrow, all these backward horses starting to plot a path away from each other so that they're not running over top of each other. He did the same thing last year with Opportunity. If you remember, Opportunity uh, ran well early in January in, in, uh, in Santa Anita and then went for two road trips before coming back to the Santa Anita Derby. So I can see Lord Nelson hitting the road, and you know Texas read the plan already. They can go Risen Star and then come back from the Santa Anita Derby at the end of the sprint. All right, and uh, again, the countdown to the crown package. You uh, preview and review some of the big three-year-old stakes. But you also preview some of the uh, undercard races uh, on the weekends, uh, maiden specials, uh, non-winners are one, those kind. And one of the maiden races that you uh, pointed out for this weekend was one that I, I thought had the potential going forward to maybe have a, a winner that comes out and becomes interesting. That was the maiden special on uh, Saturday down at Oak Lawn that featured uh, Conquest Curlinate, who uh, second choice in here. Latrum was the uh, three to uh, two favorite. Uh, Latrum will run second coming out of a maiden uh, uh, or a debut effort uh, down at Fairgrounds. Similar with Conquest Curlinate, only one race prior. That was at Woodbine in the middle of November. But Mark Cassie has been going so well the past couple of months. Conquest Curlinate, start number two, wins pretty easily as the nine to five second choice in here. And again, this being only the second career start, obviously benefited from the first out education. And I think this horse is going to be interesting to watch going forward. Yeah, you know, he lost four or five lengths at the start. He kind of bobbled and got shuffled back and, and, and had to make up a lot of ground. And he did it without the most dirt kind of daisy cutter action you could expect to see. He's kind of up and down and choppy stride, uh, not negatively, but more like a turf and poly kind of horse. And so this is a horse that's going to have some options because he obviously can run well on the dirt. This was a nice performance. Uh, beating Latrim was a, was a good effort. He was coming out of a good race at fairgrounds. And then tipping over to Oak Lawn for Steve Asmussen. These top two horses look like standouts on paper, and they ran that way. Conquest Curlinate now is going to have some options. I mean, maybe he goes to Turfway for the spiral, you know, and goes back to some of that poly form. Uh, you know, maybe he stays on the dirt during the Oak Lawn pass. Uh, Cassie's done this uh, California to Oak Lawn move uh, with some success already. Cancun is a horse who won earlier in the meet. Cancun, surprisingly, was one who wasn't nominated to the Triple Crown. I thought uh, that Cassie may nominate that runner as well. But Conquest Curlinate is a Triple Crown nominee, and I like this win. And, and again, he beat a good horse. Later, he's going to be 2-5 to five next time in a maiden special at Oak Lawn and, and, and graduate. So this is, this is a good performance. It was a split division race. Uh, they also went uh, in race four earlier in the card. Magic of Believe in one for Kenny McPeak. And, and, and Magic of Believe in one a little faster, but I think the fractions were the cause for that race. They went in very similar final time. But the Magic of Believe in race was a little bit quicker. But I think looking forward at the prospect, Conquest Curlin it looks more impressive to me than Magic of Believe. All right. And finally, let's uh, just take a little preview. And, again, I'm sure you will have a more uh, – Comprehensive preview uh, in Friday's Countdown to the Crown Package, but coming up on the weekend in New York is the Withers, and that means El Kabir, and El Kabir coming out of a win most recently in the Jerome. Prior to that, the Kentucky uh, Jockey Club. Um, so obviously the, all eyes will be on him. But classy class coming out of uh, the Remsen last time out of fourth place finish could be interesting. General Bellamy is a potential starter. A couple of uh, Chad Brown runners, March and Market uh, Conduct. Combat diver for Gary Contessa, who uh, was well beaten in the Remsen, but has been off since then and may come back a little bit as uh, an improved three-year-old, although that one is also looking at the Miracle Wood down at Laurel. I I'm anticipating kind of a fun field in here, but as I say, all eyes will be on El Kabir. Yeah, El Kabir's got that, uh, you know, national name, but yet a winter horse at uh, Africa. So we don't see that too often on the trail where horses kind of made them names for themselves and then didn't tip out and go to Florida. So he, he's going to have the, the leg up. I think March is an interesting horse for, uh, for Chad Brown, like we talked about. That necessity is the mother of invention. Again, here's another one who's going to stretch out and see what he can do. He really impressed me uh, off his last couple races. And it's time for him to make a step up in the distance challenge. I think March is one of those horses uh, for Chad Brown who can kind of come up and fill the shoes a little bit for Leave the Light on. Sarah McLaughlin's always very tough in the Withers historically. You can find all the stats and trends uh, for the Withers history on our Countdown to the Crown preseason annual. So that magazine, you know, 
continues to give you a weekly prep preview. And if you look at the trends of the withers, you'll know uh, just looking down quickly that the Kira McLaughlin always has a horse ready to roll um, in this race. So I would expect that McLaughlin, uh, whatever he sends out, I think Mahfouk might be uh, his representative in the race. I would expect him to be uh, cranked and ready for this particular event. And uh, also coming up on the weekend, Kentucky Derby Future Pool 2. I wonder if you t have taken a look at the morning line odds. You see anything of interest in here. And I'll just mention Divining Rod not on, so it looks like you have to take that even money morning line uh, on the <laughs> mutual field if, you, if, you, if you're tied into that one. Yeah, you know, I'm looking for something 40 to 1 or yeah. more this time of year. And so, you know, we'll play the odds and, and then see what uh, uh, comes about. But if you don't get at least 40 to 1 this far out, I mean, look, it's preps away from the Derby. So you've got to get through two more, you know, hurdles. And, and so it's a long way out. And, and so, you know, whoever you just dive into, I would say you either get something 40 to 1 or above or take the field. And the field's not the worst play in the world um, early in the season. The field was obviously the much better play back in that November pool that they threw out around Thanksgiving weekend. But, you know, now it's still not a bad play at all if you can get somewhere along the line of even money from an investment standpoint. But I'm not into those kind of things. I'm not going to bet at even money just to – to try to cast a little extra on Derby there, or heads against my plays. You know, I'll be looking for a horse who can, uh, you know, be offered at a very big price. And, and typically, those will be horses not running this weekend because everybody's attention is focused on those of the individual entrants who are uh, entered this weekend. So, you know, look for a price. And if we can get something, I was hoping like Prospect Park or something to be involved. Uh, um, you know, but we've got to sort through the field a little bit more and see what's out there. But again, it's about price shop at this time of year. If you can catch, you know, uh, a big horse, you know, the Derby's gotten a little chalky in the last couple of years. So, you know, maybe the future specs are, are, are something that are a little more appealing to folks now because, you know, you know we think about Giacomo and Mind That Bird and, and horses like that and say, well, why take, you know, 21 now when I can get 40 <laughs> or 50 to 1 on Derby Day? But, you know, after watching Orb and uh, California Chrome and some shorter prices the past couple of years, you know, maybe something in that 30, 40 to 1 now, uh, right now uh, to make the Derby Day a little bit more exciting. Well, the two on the morning line that look a little bit interesting are uh, Far Right and uh, Ocean Night at 50 to 1. We'll see how that plays out by Sunday, but at this point they look a little interesting. And, Jeremy, before we let you go, just wanted to uh, note, you know, there are plenty of times we uh, question trainers and which races they pick, jockeys in the heat of the moment, go inside, go outside, making decisions. But it's not just horse racing because we watch the Super Bowl on Sunday night and they can make bad decisions in every sport. Oh, yeah, my goodness. One of the worst one of the worst calls you're ever going to see. Hey. You know, I had no skin in the game as far as how it turned out. But, you know, and there's a lot, too. I mean, I, I've got a, I've, I've got a, a, a blog you can Google online and, and find out. But there's some comparisons to the Super Bowl and how it pertains to horse racing and, and kind of the storylines of, you know, the no-name people stepping up and, yeah. and, and having a big performance. We see that every single year. It's Art Sherman. It's, it, it's John Service. It's Stuart Elliott. Uh, we see it all the time in our game, and, and, and that's what makes horse racing so awesome, you know. In the Super Bowl, they saw it, and it became this national deal that, you know, oh, my goodness, these guys, Malcolm Butler, we've never heard of, saved the Super Bowl out of Western Alabama University, you know. And, and, and the guy who was uh, working at Foot Locker ended up getting 100 yards. Yeah, Matthews. Yeah, Matthews, you know. So we see this every single year in, in, in the Kentucky Derby, and that's why Red Smith and, and the great sports writers of the past love to cover horse racing because, in the Super Bowl, everybody's like, wow, this is a once-in-a-lifetime thing. We get this every single year in horse racing. That's the beautiful thing of the Triple Crown Trail. Yeah, great point. All right, Jeremy, we'll let you go. And, again, a reminder, Friday means Countdown to the Crown. The updated package comes out. Definitely stop by CountdownToTheCrown.com, uh, HorsePlayerNow.com. Jeremy, thanks. We'll talk to you next week. Okay, take care, everybody. All right, we'll wrap up this segment. We'll come back in just a couple of moments.